quality options. Uh, and, and it is a state's job, it is an authorizing body's job to make sure those options are quality. So more charters isn't the answer. You gotta make sure that school, traditional public schools, public charter schools are being held to high standards and whether there are, you know, perhaps unhealthy things happening, like, you know, over segregation, like really, really underperforming schools, like somebody has to hold those schools accountable for delivering for kids at the end of the day. Wow, we're walking there. Um, one thing that's been interesting because we have kind of an entire charter model um, that all reports to the recovery school district and that all has kind of a state level accountability is that there have there has now to be some sort of governing board that handles things like um, expulsions from schools. So that's one traditional way where you might kind of call your student body and make it to be what you want it to be by sending kids out or counseling them out. So now there's a formal process by which you have to, um, but by which you can't expel a student. You can't just um, let it, you know, get rid of a student that way. Um, and kind of the centralized application process also does some, I mean, it makes it a little bit more equitable so that some schools, I mean, one way is to only market your school to the kind of kids that you want. And so, you know, it's kind of one way to kind of prevent that. Um, but I do think it's a, a larger issue. So I believe the, um, the, the data says that on average, charter school test performance is not materially different from traditional public school test performance with comparable student populations. But there are some charter schools, and I know we had at least one representative on the panel, that do seem to be able to drive superior performance on a consistent basis. I'm wondering if you guys have any ability to discern what differentiates the successful charter school programs from the average charter school program. And if so, is any of that replicable and scalable? That's a very excellent question. Um, as, as Enoch alluded to, it really can't view charters on mass in terms of this is the um, silver bullet to be able to, to solve the, the issue that you have um, addressed. But one of the things that we do at the Harlem Children's Zone is we're really serious about data. Um, so it's not enough just to collect data, but how do you use data to iterate practice? Um, and this is a continual process. Um, the harsh reality of the work that we do is the data is ugly. Right, so you have to be prepared to be able to take that um, and not be paralyzed by it. But how do you use that to inform practice? How does that inform your professional development with the teachers? How, do you able, how are you able to tailor um, individualized, call it, um, agendas for students that meets the students where they are? When you're talking about differentiating a classroom of 20 to 25 different students, how do you meet the student at the point where they need intervention? So part of that is how are you structuring the classroom? How are you scheduling the day? Um, but there's not going to be one thing that um, can be said as this is the, the one solution in order to derive um, great scores. Um, but in the charter school context, having the flexibility to be able to do um, those choices to be able to individualize practice for kids um, is a way that we found successful in driving outcomes for our students, but being very serious about data usage and data analysis. Pamela, um, so you're in schools a lot. Uh, you work with teachers a lot. I'm wondering if you could give us charter, traditional, public, private, what, whatever, the, you know, some characteristics of a great school, of a great classroom, about something that is really delivering for kids. Thank you. Um, well, what Enik didn't tell you is that I was a curriculum coordinator in the Boston Public Schools, the Reading Public Schools, and the Arlington Public Schools, and I was an elementary principal for 19 years. Been there, done that, have many t-shirts. <laughs> um, I think um, it's a kind of a singularity of, of purpose, that there has to be a cohesion um, at the school about what is what good instruction looks like, and what good instruction looks like you know, to, regardless of which first grade teacher you get, and then regardless of which second grade teacher you get. And so that it has to be horizontal and vertical alignment in terms of your expectations and in terms of your instructional language and in terms of the program. Um, oftentimes um, we get, you know, we get programs put into schools and we don't give them enough time. We look at the data, we don't look at the data in a deep way, we just look at it in a surface way. And sometimes, um, schools that are underperforming will be given programs. The teachers will be given a program. And then, you know, you talk, I talk to teachers around their professional development. Their professional development has been around the program. It's like the way, the truth, and the light. 
you know, and then they're given pacing guides, and they're give, you know, they're highly scripted because this is what works. And then I talked to teachers, and I said, well, how about you know adding more informational text to your? I don't have time. If I had time, I, I would do it. So wait a minute, you don't have time to teach the children who are sitting in front of you. Well, I've got to make these pacing guides, and so we get kind of into this consumerism of what we buy and how we implement it is going to solve all the problems for children. Whereas we have to have teachers who can look at the data and decide what is right for the children in front of him or her. How to use the materials with fidelity of implementation to best meet their needs and how to marshal the resources within the school to differentiate the instruction. The other issue that I've been doing some research on is culturally responsive instruction. And as um, I think um, Giddings is now saying, culturally sustaining instruction. And so our children are at the best half empty, half full, not half empty. You know, our children bring a lot of resourcefulness to the school environment. Unfortunately, sometimes the school environment doesn't privilege that level of resourcefulness. So really trying to implement the curriculum with fidelity, look at the children that are in front of you as what they bring to the educational environment versus what they lack, and make them feel that they have some agency and some skin in the game. So you mentioned curriculum, Pamela, so I'm, I'm gonna transition for a second and we'll, we'll have many, much more time for many more questions about charters. But let's talk about the Common Core for a second. So who in this room, if you raise your hand, feels like they really know what the Common Core is? Really know. Mm. Okay, so that's what you're working with, Pamela. So tell, tell the people, tell the, and this, these are Harvard Black alums. Yes. Uh, so tell them what the Common Core is, what it means for our kids, what it means for teachers, and why it is a difference maker, if it is a difference maker. The Common Core state standards uh, came out of the National Gov Governors Association and the Chief State School Officers. So it was actually started from a political agenda versus an instructional agenda. So you need to know that history. There were a lot of um, very um, important educators who actually wrote them. Um, if you're from Massachusetts, we had the Massachusetts frameworks and um, we claim, the urban legend is, they modeled the Common Core State Standards after the Massachusetts Standards. Yeah. Take it for what it's worth. Um, but um, it really, um, I mean, in the United States, Education is a state's rights issue. And when we had, we have no child left behind and we have these high stakes standards. And we have the high stakes testing, but the testing in Alaska does not look like the testing in Alabama. The testing in Massachusetts does not look like the testing in, in Montana. And so this was, uh, the Common Core State Standards was a way to kind of make the metric e e equal. So we weren't using different rulers to decide whether our children were succeeding and, and meeting high standards. So one thing that makes people crazy about the Common Core State Standards is they feel that they have their agency as educators has been taken away. It's really a standard. It's not how you get there. And so I think there is a lot more latitude within them for instructional innovation than people think. Um, some big changes which you know conceptually aren't shouldn't be that big a deal is you know more emphasis on informational text because we're trying to get people college and career ready and so in your careers and when you were at college you know how many once upon a time you know in a deep dark wood did you really read you know you were reading informational text when you're now in your positions, you're reading memos, you're reading technical documents. So we need to get the children really more into informational text sooner. Sounds like a game changer. But really when you think about a six-year-old, they don't know, want to know about you know, Little Red Riding Hood. They want to know, like, why is the sky blue? Why do the roots go down and the stem goes up? You know, why, how does a fire engine make all that noise? 
they're really interested in the world around them. And as an elementary principal, we noticed that our children um, weren't doing so well in informational text, and so I, I used the bully pulpit and said, thou shalt read more informational text. And I was lucky that I had some teachers who were really to, willing to take that leap of faith, and I used to cruise through, we now call them walkthroughs. Uh, and um, I went into a second grade teacher, and you know, the little children went in front of her, and they were you know, twirling their hair, picking their noses, and all that other good stuff. And she goes, snakes, Dr. Mason. I'm reading about snakes. And they were really enthralled. And so she needed to change her practice to really understand that they would be just as engaged in snakes as they would be in some um, narrative text. The other game changer, which has been difficult, is around writing. If you think about college and career now, how do you introduce yourself to somebody? In an email or a tweet? Well, you really don't want typos in that, right? Um, so we're introducing ourselves more through the written word and, and creating first impressions now than we did before. And so within the Common Core State Standards, again, there is more emphasis at earlier grades on argumentative writing and persuasive writing. And that is something that a lot of teachers have to be trained on how to do. But if you think again of six-year-olds, and those of you who may have small children or grandchildren, they're very persuasive about getting what they want like dessert without eating dinner, or being able to stay up later than their bedtime. So you know they have that national pension. We just have to teach them how to put it down on paper and to get the teachers not so afraid of teaching argument and persuasion, because the children kind of know how to do that already. So in the spirit of argument, for the folks who, um, who are in the room who know about Common Core, for those of you who may not agree with it or may not be sold, like what are some of your issues with what you know to be the Common Core? And Pam was going to convince you of why they're wrong. Twenty-five words or less on a box. Persuasively. Actually, I think you did um, probably a better job than anyone I've spoken to already. I have a seventh grader uh, in North Carolina, and so they adopted the Common Core a couple of years ago. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about it, and now the legislature is throwing it out because they're going to build their own, and we're going to spend a lot of tax money on them, probably building something that's very similar in, in my mind. I think a lot of the controversy has been around the, the testing aspects of it, mm -hmm. um, which is somewhat of a concern. But the question I have for you is um, you talk about the informational text, and I, I do think that that is great. My concern with my sixth grader last year was they did not read any fiction at all. It was totally absent. And so my question is around where does creative writing, where do the arts fit in, or how do you balance that with Common Core Focus? I'm glad you, you mentioned that. I think that that's like an overreaction, you know, like the, that the teachers may have been trying to make up for years of lack of informational text. But if you, and I don't have them memorized, but if you look at it, <clears throat> I think it's a, they're supposed to be about 30% um, in um, narrative reading and um, with kind of uh, narrative writing, you know, more you know, fictional writing within the Common Core. So if you look at, and that's directly taken from the National Assessment of Educational Pro Progress's framework, which has been around for a long time and I sit on the reading subcommittee of that, so that the, the switch actually in the writing and the reading was maybe highlighted in the Common Core State Standard, but they've been around for a long time, so if and you know of anybody or your children have take, been part of the NAEP assessments, they've already been exposed to that. So it, it just, you know, it's, it's an overreaction, I think, and, and sadly. Other qualms with the Common Core? I won't characterize as a qualm with the Common Core. Um, I think we're putting the, the horse before the cart. It's web-based assessment. We make assumptions that all that there's internet access equitably in all zip codes, and they're not. We make an assessment that just because the kid has a mobile device that is standardized enough to adapt to the preparation for the Common Core, 
there's a two-year pencil and paper waiver, but no one's exercising that waiver. So first issue is, uh, particularly with charters, uh, there's two things. One, what is the pre-service training that goes into the qualifications for someone, even from TFA, to teach in an urban district? Um, secondly, oh, do we have the assurances that we have equity in the computing skills before we look at whether or not we're testing for knowledge. And so my issue is, one, what is being done at the charter school level to ensure that there's equitable access to the internet to prepare and perform competently on web-based test assessments where you don't have the two-year waiver for paper and pencils? And secondly, what are the requirements for pre-service training for the teachers that are coming into the charter schools? Um, so to the first part of your question in terms of, I guess, IT literacy um, in a way, I think what we're doing at the Harlem Children's Zone is trying to make sure that we are teaching our, our children the skills in terms of how to utilize technology. So for example, um, in our Promise Academy One Charter School, um, we, we've given each student access to a tablet to be able to use in the classroom. Um, we've already started um, a web-based uh, assessment called iReady in terms of being able to work with our students in ELA and math and getting them used to be able to, to learn from the computer and working in, in sort of like a blended learning model. Um, we also do a survey to be able to see who has um, technology at home and in some instances be able to provide support where they're lacking. Um, we recently just embarked on a home Wi-Fi campaign so within our zone there's actually free access to, to Wi-Fi. Um, we work with this, the city um, along with that. So um, making sure that we've equipped our students with the resources to become IT literate so that they can be able to learn um, and stay up to date with the changes in technology is, is, is critical for us. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about the sorts of professional development that we do at our school, um, which when I talk to folks who work at traditional public schools, it seems to be a unique difference. Um, between what they are experiencing in terms of teacher training and then what we are providing at our school, um, with the caveat that I'm not a teacher, and so I observe it and let them do what they're doing and I focus on college stuff. Um, so you asked about kind of what sorts of training teachers receive before they come, and so one of the transitions that I've seen happen with charter schools in New Orleans um, has to do with thinking about how to make the, the career of teaching a little bit more sustainable. So we normally think of charter schools as kind of having high turnover rates and the teachers being very young, fresh out of college, maybe receiving a couple years, a couple of weeks of training over the summer and then being brought in to work with our neediest students. Um, so at a school like ours, the majority of teachers who we bring in are already experienced, um, which is a decision that our leadership has made. And we still do kind of um, patronize TFA and bring in a, a few younger folks um, but the average age at our school is 30, um, which kind of in the, in the world is still young, but in the charter school world is actually a little bit older. Um, and then kind of in terms of the ongoing training that students um, or that teachers receive, there is a huge emphasis on data, which is what kind of Kwame was alluding to before. Um, there's training every Wednesday. We do professional development, so students get out early and the rest of that is entirely dedicated to teachers meeting with their mentors. Um, and these are folks who are in and out of the classroom throughout the week to observe, make notes, make recommendations, um, and then go over the data with those students on a weekly basis. And then we also look at data at a school-wide level to say, how are students doing behavior-wise? Um, kind of one of the things that's been in the news a lot, for example, in New Orleans has to do with suspension. So how do we control behavior with students? Um, suspension rates are way too high. And so that's something we would work on at a school level to say, where's our suspensions now? Um, and what sort of systems can we put in place? And so at our school, for example, um, we've taken the ability to suspend a student away from a teacher. And so what a teacher can do is send the student out and there are cool down desks in the hallway that we've all been trained on and we man, um, where you speak to a student, it's kind of the social work team has trained us to work, walk a student through from where they were to being disruptive in class to being able to get back in and get their instructional minutes. Um, and so there kind of has become a ladder of consequences before you can suspend a student as an example. So kind of at the charter school level, because there's a lot more hours that students, that, that teachers spend in school and there isn't a limit. Um, and um, I think because of the emphasis on data, we can kind of maneuver a bit more quickly than if there were a more bureaucratic system. Um, we've seen that be successful. So our charter network um, has made a history of going in and taking over the worst performing school. So the high school that I work at, Cohen College Prep, 
The original school is Walter L. Cohen. If you Googled it, National Geographic came in a few years back um, and did a documentary on the school as the most dangerous school in America. And um, so when I go, I got an opportunity to table for our school, for example, and I'm used to people coming to my table. You know, I've done Harvard, I've done Exeter, and folks want to come to my school. I've never seen folks walk, make a circle around the table to avoid even like looking into my eyes. Um, so that's kind of the stigma that our school is dealing with, and yet we found the test scores have risen to kind of the fourth highest in the, in the city. Um, our students receive the highest amount of scholarships for college out of any open enrollment school in the city, so there have been lots of changes made. And my observation has been because of how flexible the staff has to be, because the principal has the power to hire and fire whomever at the school is or is not on board, um, and then because of how much time is spent going over the data, both weekly, um, and then kind of there are other data days where we don't have, have class and everything is kind of dedicated to instruction and instructional training. Uh, Ty, going back to the, to the tech piece uh, and young people's um, you know, proclivity for technology, ability to adapt very quickly. Kwame told us about some of the stuff that HCZ is doing within their service area to make sure that kids are ready and well trained up uh, when these web-based uh, or computer-based assessments um, are implemented, but I'm wondering, like, from you work with kids, so uh, tell us a little bit about the platform uh, that you have built for students, what you're finding uh, their experience to be, and, and how it all connects to all of this. Okay, sure. So, uh, <clears throat> people not allowed to clear their throat on the mic anymore? I'm just messing with you guys. Uh, so, yeah. My law labs, 95% um, of, of high school students graduate financially illiterate. 76% of college students graduate with credit card debt, which is you know, one of the most expensive forms of debt outside of some al alternative uh, services like you know, check cashers, paid loans, etc. cetera. 68% uh, of young adults are not investing for retirement. And um, you know, more than, than half of current retirees cannot actually afford to retire. So essentially we're at, we're at a, 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 an absolutely critical point in terms of um, you know, the, the financial landscape of, uh, of America. Hundreds of millions of Americans are financially illiterate. Uh, and now the, the interesting thing is, um, you know, while school-based personal finance instruction is potentially one of the um, you know, has one of the greatest abilities to improve the financial capability of youth. Most of the personal finance courses are more similar to the economics uh, class in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Uh, where, where students, you know, the minute you say something about money, their eyes glaze over, they start dozing off, right? Um, and, and, and it's just, it's just the, the antithesis of engaging. So what we have done is we have developed a platform uh, to to engage students, get them excited to talk about money. We developed a, um, a, a, a fun mobile financial education game it's called Thrive and Shine. Uh, students describe it as a mashup between Candy Crush and The Sims, but by playing it, they develop real money management skills such as budgeting, saving, credit score management, debt management, etc. Uh, so now the game itself is extremely engaging. I mean, kids are calling it life changing and this and that. And, you know, they're they're addicted to it. I mean, it's it's really uh, crazy how how it happens with games. But anyways, uh, so the game itself is, is really engaging. And initially, we were thinking about um, you know pursuing the you know sort of the the viral growth strategy, uh, you know, that the Facebook and some of these other tech start startups do going college to college. And we actually launched on a couple of college campuses and, and saw really great uh, results there. But we decided against doing this, uh, this viral growth strategy and sort of like uh, this game just standing on its own outside of the classroom when we really consider, you know, how are we going to impact kids? How are we going to, because what we're, we're, we're doing is we're not trying to teach them what a credit score is. We want them to actually change their behavior and never pay a bill late. We don't ever want them to, um, uh, we, we want them to start, start establishing credit history early on. We want them to understand what interest rates are, et cetera, right? And they, they understand it's because they, they do it. So um, what we have decided to do is to partner with schools 
and nonprofits in order to double down on the impact that our game is having. And so that's, that's uh, essentially what we're doing right now. And, and recently, um, the, the U.S. Treasury Department um, established a Treasury Empowerment Innovation Fund where they um, are essentially you know, giving away money uh, to, 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 test, um, uh, to test, pilot, and evaluate new ways to empower um, Americans with financial capability and provide them with safe and reliable access to financial products and services. So Mindblown Labs was one of the 11 uh, projects out of you know, 326 um, you know, that apply to actually receive, receive funding um, you know, through this innovation fund. And our contract is to, um, to, to essentially do this program that we have. Our approach involves the game, plus lesson plans, plus teacher training, plus uh, access to savings accounts. And so it's these four components, they're essentially best practices uh, across the board. And we think that, that that sort of, um, you know, outside of just a you know, game, it's great to have a game or whatever, but we're talking about real impact. And we think that partnering with schools, uh, effectively leveraging technology, we have a web-based version as well, so it's mobile uh, plus web-based to address, you know, the uh, you know, tech divide. Uh, but, but, but you also need the teacher training. Uh, that, that somebody brought up earlier. And then also, you know, we, we need to give them the opportunity to actually practice what they're learning outside of the classroom. So that's sort of, uh, I hope I answered your question. No, that was helpful. And, and so sticking on uh, ed tech for a second, I'm wondering from folks like Kwame and, and Pam with Paris, what, what has been the coolest thing to happen in ed tech? Is it Khan Academy? Is it you know, uh, for your teachers, is it something like Amplify or whatever the data-driven assessment system that you guys use is? Like, what has been for you the game changer, and and what, in what ways does the game still need to be changed? Um, so the first thing that comes to mind for me, all of our kind of the data collection obviously takes place. Um, outside of a paper-based um, collection method. And so one of the, the struggles that we've had as a school is finding a company who has um, a product that will work consistently um, and reliably for, for teachers to keep their grades and for us to track all of the data that we're tracking. Um, this year, we just made a transition to another uh, company who won't be named, um, and we're just we're just having a lot of trouble um, with that company being reliable. And so I've just noticed this being a trend. So if any kind of tech folks out there are looking at developing something that schools need, schools need to be able to track their grades. Folks aren't keeping paper, you know, grade books anymore. All of this is online. We use it with students. When I'm at that cool down desk I mentioned, I'm asking, so how are your grades doing? And I'm pulling it up on my computer, and we're talking about the Fs that are there and how this is going to impact your scholarships for college. So we need to have um, real-time access to data, and, and we just haven't been pleased with the, the platforms that are currently available. Um, I had already mentioned um, a technology that we use in the classroom that helps out with differentiation. Uh, another technological advancement that actually has been very helpful to us um, is an app, I believe it's called Remind 101, uh, which allows us to be able to text message and get messages out to parents, um, which has been a key driver for us in terms of our parent engagement and the role in parents in, in, in terms of taking ownership within um, their child's education has been very helpful. Um, the request that we have to any tech folks in terms of development, if they can devise a way in which to be able to measure child engagement. Um, so it, it's, it's not enough simply just to be able to like record grades or, or things of that nature, but some of these other um, non-test assessment um, ways to, to measure um, is a student really learning would be extremely helpful to the work that we're doing. For my work with uh, pre-service teachers, back to, to, your, to your question, it's, it's about um, having the children translate some of their gaming interests and techniques to you know, more academic work. And unfortunately, you, know, you can't kind of write a, a paper with two thumbs. You know, um, as you do, you know, that's how I use my, my, my phone. Um, so it's really, you know, it, you know, and it feels very kind of throwback um, kind of throwback Thursday about, you know, keyboarding <laughs> skills. You know, like if they're going to be doing, you know, writing on a computer, you know, 
you know, they can do the two finger rule or they can try to learn how to keyboard. But I think what, um, what we're seeing with Smarter Balanced and PARC, which are the two assessments for Common Core State Standards, um, they're saying that they're, they're computer based. It's a lot of copy and paste. It's not a lot of original work going on um, on computers. So it's just kind of getting them, and they can do that you know, with, with their skills from um, their gaming, from their pad, you know, tablet um, skills. So um, you know, it's, it's, it, it is, it, and we're struggling with that with the uh, NAEP um, assessment uh, for reading, because we need to go computer-based by 2018. And we're reading, having a lot of uh, very heated discussions about, okay, are we testing literacy, or are we testing their computer skills? And sometimes they just aren't separable. So this is something that we're working on really hard. Uh, Kwame, you mentioned parents uh, and parental engagement. So, like you said, you know, uh, only about 1,800 kids are served directly in your public schools, but you serve a multitude of students and families in other ways. What are the biggest and highest leverage other ways that you guys are doing that are actually changing student outcomes, family outcomes, et cetera? As it relates to parents or just in other ways? Generally. Um, I, I think it's important to, to note the context of, of Harvard. Uh, so some statistics. 63% uh, of our, our students are born in poverty. Um, about 20% of the residents in, in Central Harlem make $15,000 or less. 46% uh, of the, the kids in our program are obese. Uh, one third of our kids have asthma. And if you think about it nationally, um, for, for single women of color, between the ages of 36 and 49, their median wealth is $5. Um, so that there are a confluence of factors at play um, when we think about educating a child. Right? There are all of these social ills that are intertwined and interconnected, so just focusing on um, one aspect um, to us doesn't seem um, sufficient. Um, so we are purposely in the deep end of the pool, as, as we call it, and trying to provide a whole host of wraparound services um, that provides a net of supports woven so thick um, that no one will be able to fall through the cracks. So it starts with um, baby college and in terms of teaching, um, expecting parents or parents who have children under the age of three um, in terms of how to stay on top of immunization records, how to uh, properly discipline your child, how to enhance their, their vocabulary. That feeds into a, a pipeline um, to our universal pre-K where children are taught in French, Spanish, and English. Um, there is a pipeline that goes to our charter school, as you mentioned, and then we have a whole host of other services that we support um, K through 12 population, whether it be after school programs and focusing on athletics or um, literacy and homework help and in terms of arts and chess and um, ballet and all types of things that we would expect um, in, in the middle class. Right? So that we want to be able to provide um, the same life that anybody in the middle class would want. Right? And we think that's a floor. Um, so in, in terms of what we would all do for our own children, we view that as our, so we're there. Um, it's no excuse if, if your parent is not involved for us. Right? But like I said, we purposely are at the deep end of the pool that um, we honestly believe that there is large potential within our communities and it's our job to be able to unlock that potential. And as I stated, I am an example of that. So I am personally driven to do this. So that's type of the ethos of, of the Harlem Children's Zone and um, the whole host of wraparound services that we provide. Is there stuff that you've tried that, that hasn't worked? Or that you've figured out just like, it's not worth the investment to continue doing this because it's not having the impact that it needs to have? I mean, it happens all the time. Um, as I stated before, that's the importance of really critically looking at data. Um, it's okay to, that something may not work, but are you willing to be able to make that tough decision and pivot? Um, accordingly. So things that come to mind would be, for example, um, a summer program that we, we were holding um, with kids and finding out that because of the competition to be able to get summer jobs to be able to pay uh, for certain things, they weren't attending as in frequency. So being able to, like, okay, maybe holding this at this certain time isn't um, the proper way of, of engaging them. Or, um, for example, people tell us all the time that and our after school programs, well, this intervention isn't working. Uh, it, it's just, we, we've had this design, we have tutors set up, the students aren't attending. Um, and it's like, are you looking at the data? So I would say, send me the attendance data. 
all right, it seems like most of the kids are, are present, then I'll say, send me the dismissal data. And it turns out that a number of the students were getting early dismissed, so they actually weren't even getting the intervention. Um, so being able to then pivot and say, okay, this schedule is not working. How do we have a flexible schedule to be able to focus on the essential aspects to be able to drive outcomes for this individual student and not necessarily be beholden to a set schedule for, for all students within our after school program? All right, we're going to open it up to Q&A now, and uh, one ground rule of this Q&A is these are questions. <laughs> questions, that's what the Q stands for. So not, you know, long soliloquies or uh, we, we don't need that. Uh, so questions, keep them to 30 seconds. Uh, if they are directed for a particular person or to a particular person, uh, include that in your question. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, my question is a lot of the conversation focuses on charter schools, whereas the vast majority of our schools are DOE schools. Um, what, are you, what can charter schools do to partner with public schools traditional schools to create not only these islands of excellence that you get with certain charters, but you get a better educational ecosystem, other things we can do in terms of teacher training or discussions or programs where we can partner together so that our entire neighborhoods are being served rather than just one or two schools. Sure, I can answer that. Um, so as I stated before, 80% of our kids are in traditional public schools. Um, so there are seven elementary um, traditional public schools within our zone, and we are in each and every one of them um, all day. Um, so it's called our Peacemakers Program. So we have AmeriCorps members um, and other of our staff that are there in the morning in terms of doing breakfast, who are there in the classroom to serve as teacher's aides that we pay them, um, in addition to running after school programs um, based at the traditional public school. So I agree with you, it's very much in, in partnership in terms of trying to share best practices with one another. And um, that's the way you achieve true scale in terms of working through the tr traditional public school system and network. So it, it's a very important to be able to have um, partnerships where people are open uh, to share data and to be able to share best practices and to drive meaningful outcomes for our students. So one of the things I've seen that's very promising, some of the bigger networks are starting to codify the lessons that they have learned um, and share them kind of in a larger scale way. So a charter school like ours, which is a single high school and two elementary schools, can make use of those lessons learned. Um, Coursera is one kind of online um, education platform where we've seen um, folks from KIPP come in and teach on how you teach non-cognitive skills to students. Um, and that's a PD that the leadership team at our school went through to learn how to do. Um, Uncommon Schools is another big network kind of up here in the Northeast. And so they have actual videos, instructional videos, where they have videotaped successful classrooms um, and kind of written down what it is that a successful teacher is doing to manage her uh, classroom. And so in our PDs, that we're looking at those videos, we're practicing those skills. So they're really, I mean, we have found some practices that work in public schools and folks are finding ways to share them. Um, so, if, you know, I just hope that we can continue to keep those uh, growing so we can keep using those. Um, hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for your presentations. I have one uh, question for, for Ty, and I did walk in late, so if you've addressed this before, my apologies. I love the idea that you're using something, uh, a new medium, games, to help teach about finances. We absolutely need this. But one question I have is, is the, do we have data, or is there simply an assumption that what one does, what one spends a lot of time on in gaming, will be naturally applied to life? Uh, are these, I, I, I love playing Monopoly, but I'm not a monopolist. Uh, so <laughs> if you have some information on that, I, that would be really helpful. Because I think sometimes where things should logically extend and where they end up, sometimes they meet, sometimes they don't. Yes. Yeah. That's a, that's a terrific question. Thanks a lot for asking. Uh, so in terms of, of data, we're, so actually with this uh, treasury contract, we're doing a uh, randomized control trial study. Uh, and we're analyzing, you know, we, uh, for everybody, uh, there's a treatment group, right? Um, it's randomized, so uh, there's no real difference between the two different groups. The treatment group goes to our, our program. So that's the game, lesson plans, teacher training, 
uh, the kids don't get trained, but you know, teachers do. And then the uh, access to savings accounts, and then the control group goes through the traditional instruction. You know, the, the teachers aren't being trained. It's the exact same instruction as normal to see, like, are there any differences in terms of their financial capabilities? So that means their real life behavior. So in terms of budgeting, in terms of saving, and, and a few other real life behaviors that we're measuring during the, um, during the study period. Financial literacy, so that's straight up knowledge, right? So do you know what an interest rate is? Do you know what a credit score is? Stuff like that. And questions that assess assess this uh, short answer, fill, you know, multiple choice, fill in the blank, et cetera. And then the third one is a financial self-efficacy. You know, their attitudes, perceptions, uh, beliefs regarding financial products and services. So we are actually doing a study on that. But in addition to that, the really cool thing about what we're doing is we have within our game a very powerful assessment system uh, that whereby we're, we, um, we have these quests and challenges within the game where students can demonstrate the extent to which they understand uh, particular concepts. Uh, so we have all of this behavioral assessment data that we're collecting on every single individual student. We're going to analyze that, compare that to their performance, of course, on, on these uh, different uh, assessments, evaluations. So uh, short answer is, is no, we don't know for sure right now whether or not it will result in long-term behavioral change. Uh, the more, I guess, nuanced answer is we will soon, uh, not only through the study, but, but also we're gonna be launching longitudinal studies as well, looking at real life. Uh, out, it, within the study, we're actually looking at uh, tracking savings behavior, like I said, uh, budget and some, uh, budgeting and some other real life outcomes. But in addition to that, eventually we'll get into more longitudinal things, looking at credit scores and some of these other outcomes. So. Theoretically, our approach will work because they are um, the, where the teacher in the classroom is linking their gameplay, their experiences within the game to real life and helping them understand the connection, helping them br to bridge that connection. And that's the reason that we actually went to the to the partnering with schools in the classroom based model, because we, we did fear the exact same thing that, yeah, maybe they won't. Uh, translate exactly what they're doing in the game to, to real life, and so we we hope that it works. We'll know, uh, you know. So, yeah. uh, it's called Thrive and Shine, and I'm going to. Uh, so the current version that's in the App Store and Google Play Store is is what we in tech call the MVP, the minimally viable product. A lot of times you're supposed to launch something that you're you're embarrassed to show people. So it's a little bit embarrassing. We're gonna have another version uh, in the App Store and Google Play Store in two weeks. So uh, I'd say download the second version, not the first. First one that that metal is rated 4.6, but still uh, a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> Um, so this question is not only for the panel, but also for the moderator as well. Um, what's the biggest challenge or challenges that you're facing when it comes to preparing our kids for college? I'm going to talk about the biggest challenge. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask just in general what the biggest challenge is. Um, so, so one of the issues um, that I've seen a lot, that we've all seen a lot in the media is this idea of undermatching and wanting to make sure that students are going to a school that is appropriately matched to their academic abilities. One of the problems that we have found is that uh, the reason that our students, our college counselor is phenomenal, and our students are getting into kind of the, the school that is appropriately matched to them, they cannot afford to go. And so we actually have a financing problem in our country, and we have a, a select few schools, like Harvard, that provide, um, that meet 100% of financial need, but that's not the vast majority of schools. Um, so most of our kids are going you know, down the street to one of the state schools because that's the only place they could afford to go. And they're gonna face a lot more barriers attempting to get through the bureaucracy and the, some of the, we're just, we're just finding so many challenges for our students at those schools. And they could have gone somewhere else if they had an extra 10K in their pocket, um, which they don't. And so that's kind of one of the challenges that we as a network are trying to figure out. Um, maybe it's more public-private partnerships because the money just simply isn't there for folks who are right in the middle. So these aren't folks going to Harvard. They're you know, folks who are scoring at an average level who could get into a better school and simply cannot afford to go. I'd love to find a solution for that. Um, I would say that um, one of the is seeing that is that it's an option. That seeing that's something that I can aspire to. 
especially with our first generation students when they have they, this is not the, the dinner table conversation you know that you're going to be a good first grader so you can get to college you're going to be a good fifth grader and learn a lot so you can get to college um, so I think that's one impediment the other impediment is a societal one we don't celebrate people who go to college we celebrate the athletes and the entertainers who sometimes send a very explicit message that I didn't go to college and look what I got. So I think that we really have to think about, you know, we say on one hand, college and career ready, and on the other hand, we're saying, okay, you know, you're gonna be the one in whatever the odds are to get to the NBA or the NFL and get your brains blown out and, you know, be a Lutheran idiot, you know, when you're 35 years old, which is sad. You know, I really feel to some extent we're back to the Romans. We who are about to die salute you because that's what we are doing. We are taking our young people and we are using them for our enjoyment and we're beating them up and spitting them out. And I don't, and, but that's what our children aspire to and it makes me really sad. And so being an, an educator and really trying to one, make that an important and attainable option is really important. Um, I would add to that and say um, academic behaviors and choices that they make in school. So um, right now we have 866 um, students in college and we also have a college success office where we have 40 um, counselors who essentially stay in touch and have um, a caseload of students. And some of the common themes um, that we hear um, tie back to academic behaviors, right? It's not okay to smoke weed at 9 a.m. every day. Probably not go to class. <laughs> or then it's, it's not okay to be able to party every night, probably not gonna go to class the, the next day. Or it's not okay to go on an engineering track and say you hate math. That doesn't work. Um, so what are the supports that we're providing with our students um, to ensure that they have the proper academic behavior that allows students to be successful in the college environment? Yeah, and the only thing that I'd add, so I have, I run uh, five schools, 2,000 kids, 1,000 student high school, all of our kids know about college. All of our the expe expectation is that all of our kids are applying to college. At this point, uh, of our seniors, about 92% have gotten into a four-year university. Now, these are not Harvards. They are not Harvards. Uh, <laughs> but you know, our, our kids are very proud. College goingness is an expectation. Uh, but the bottom line is, like, when you get there, you gotta be ready. And there are all the impediments, like you know, the financial aspects or leaving home that some of our kids aren't used to. But like, you, you can't go to college and then you know enter, have to enter into four remedial courses, not knowing how to write, not knowing how to you know do algebra one, and expect to finish in four years, in six years. So while for us, ninety-eight percent of our kids year over year get into a four-year university. What we have found is that, I think, our six-year graduation rate, uh, when last we checked, was about 12%. So kids aren't making it through. Um, and that's that's on us, and we gotta figure out whether it's what HCZ is doing with the College Success Office that actually sees them through, um, or what we do when we have them for the 12 years or the four years or however long we have them to make sure that they are ready and have the fortitude to actually knock that apart. I have a question about um, getting preparing the kids to get ready to go to college, which means they're taking those more competitive classes in high school, middle school, high school. And I'm very active with my son's high school, and we found that a lot of kids actually test very well to be in an IB, AP honors classes but they're not socially prepared. They're socially disenfranchised when they get into these classes where they're the only African-American. You know, they can't talk about a lot of the things that was talked about earlier at the panel over at the church about traveling, about doing things that are socially acceptable. And we're trying to, through professional development with some of the teachers, um, give them some skills to identify that and to work with the kids, but I wonder if you guys are doing anything at your respective schools that 
is around social engagement and preparing kids to socially be ready to be in environments like you are when you arrive at Harvard and other schools where you know you you are the only African American or you haven't had certain social experiences that are standard. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, so, what program who does um, excellent training throughout the spring? Uh, for seniors is called Posse. Not sure if folks are familiar with that. So um, the way that the program works is they, I mean, there's a rigorous selection process and they're finding students who wouldn't normally be identified um, by selective schools, so who demonstrate leadership and it may just not just be uh, singly, you know, about academics. And so those students go through a series of trainings to prepare them when they're gonna enter the partner schools, which are predominantly white liberal arts, small colleges up here in the Northeast um, I've just kind of come from visiting some of our students who are going through their, that experience. And so it's been um, good for me to see them adjusting to very racist environments. They have crazy stories to tell, but they're taking it in stride. And so I think whatever has happened in that program has helped them. Um, we haven't kind of tried to take that and, and use it in our schools. And just yet, the majority of our students aren't going to schools like that. Um, but if I were, that's the first place I would go to figure out how are you training those students because they've been doing that for a while. I'm going section by section, <laughs> if nobody's cracked my code yet. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, you know, I've heard a lot about, you know, ed tech and Common Core and, you know, and PARC and the other assessment. And I guess I'm just wondering about, um, just in hearing some of the statistics that have been shared, how do you reconcile the need for norm reference assessment? You know, so tests are something that are reality that all children, white, black, Brown, what have you, need to achieve on in order to have equity in their outcomes. How do you reconcile that with the need to facilitate enduring knowledge? So to me, when I hear a 98% admission and matriculation rate, but a 12% persistence and completion rate, to me, I'm wondering about the school behaviors and what is it that, what's happening to, to the kids, like how could how can so many of them get into schools but not be able to complete? And so I guess I'm wondering how do you reconcile that need for like, okay, we need we need high scores, we need high achievement, that metric, which is really narrow with enduring knowledge that's gonna help them to gain the social capital, the um, cultural capital that's gonna help them to be able to come to the Harvards and the Yales and the Princetons of the world. Because kids who get in there, white, black, and brown, not only are achieving grades, but have all of those things and are able to articulate those things to the admissions committees. So how do you reconcile this? Um, so, I, so the first thing I would mention is that the students that we are serving and that um, Enoch is serving, the, the typical graduation rate for those students is about 8%. Um, so in a way, you guys are doing a little bit better. One of the things that I have been surprised about is the sheer number of barriers that students face from the moment they are admitted to a school, even before they set foot on that campus, in terms of financial aid verification, which is a whole other process in addition to filling out the FAFSA. And if you guys remember how laborious that was, that's not the end of it. Um, and just to kind of dig probably a little deeper in that than you want to go, um, FAFSA recently has, they have verification categories, the so reasons why you have to go through this extra like, lengthy process. Um, one of the reasons could be because they think your income is too low to support the family size that you have. So at a school like ours, which serves very poor families, they're all going through this extra process. If I weren't there to walk them through it, who would? It's so many additional steps. And so if you're going to the University of Louisiana at, at Lafayette, which is one of the big state schools our, school, our students go to, um, you have to apply separately to orientation, which is required, and pay a $150 fee. You have to apply separately to housing, which is required, and pay, pay a $200 fee. Um, so there are lots of barriers that prevent students from even making it from high school graduation to setting foot on that college campus. Um, it's actually called summer melt. So there's kind of a whole term for it, and there are lots of interventions that are in the literature about how to get a student from high school into college. Um, and then there are lots of barriers like that that continue to come up, particularly particularly during that first year. So we see a lot of nonprofits developing programming that go from junior year um, or senior year in high school through to the second year in college, which is kind of where students are at the greatest risk um, of dropping out. 
So I'll, I'll let folks talk more about instruction, but there, there's, there are just so many barriers that I've been surprised by because Harvard made it so easy to walk into the door that the majority of our students, they, I mean, they really don't have that luxury. Um, and they also don't have parents or don't have a counselor who could help, help walk them through this. So, so why wouldn't they give up? And why wouldn't they just say, I'll stay home like my mom wants me to do or like folks are saying or like I see in my community because this is so difficult already. Um, what I hear you asking about a little bit is about the canon. You know, what are the students reading? Uh, what is their, quote, world knowledge um, that they can bring to the um, school and, and or career setting? Um, and if we go back to the Common Core State Standard, there actually are recommended texts at the end uh, in the appendices, and some of them are the traditional dead white men. Um, but actually, if you read it, you'd be surprised that there is more um, diversity in terms of ethnicity, uh, gender, and um, first language. There are some translated um, texts from, from Africa and from other, other um, areas of, of the world. So I think that, but we, again, that goes back to your question about pre-service training um, in that we need to get the teachers to understand that it's not just the dead white men that will get you and keep you in college. And so that's what I've been working on as a literacy specialist is to really um, expand the definition of the canon so that um, middle schoolers and high schoolers are reading um, more diverse uh, authors and, uh, and, and, and really feeling then when they get into the academy that they, um, they can hold their own in, in literary conversation. All right, so we've got time for I didn't record that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent question. Um, I think one of the things that was instilled in me uh, since my undergrad days in Harvard, uh, being with gentlemen like Enoch and Ty, Mike Bill, and others, Colustin, um, is the responsibility that we have um, as Harvard black men. That's um, right. Regardless of um, our upbringings, uh, we are now privileged. And, and with pri privilege comes a, a deep responsibility to expand the notion of what it means to be a black man and a black man in America, and a black man in this world. Um, so personally, I, 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 it was intentional um, and my choice to be able to, to join the Orange Children and be a part of this work um, is to say that there are careers that you can build uh, within the education space. I'm not a pedagogue, right? My background's in banking, uh, I'm not a teacher, um, but I have a skill set that I think will be able to drive um, this work forward in the same way as anybody, man, female, black, white, um, in this room. And, and I think the more that we um, serve as examples of career paths that you can have um, within the field of social service or education or healthcare or what have you, whatever social ill that may be a passion of yours, um, the more that you will be able to attract uh, similar talent. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an important uh, way to be able to bring uh, more people of color generally um, within the education space. Yeah, and, and another thing also, I think that uh, really the onus is on all of us black men, right? We need to get involved, we need to mentor, uh, we need to lead and uh, just be be present. And I know I know it's tough, it sucks. Uh, none of us have time, I mean, I'm strapped. But um, at the same time, you know, even, <laughs> even you know, during the startup hustle, we actually, uh, Jason and I and a couple other uh, blacks in tech, we actually, started up a uh, nonprofit where we teach black males how to code. It's a, it's a mentoring and training program. So teaching them like obviously a hard, hard skill, uh, but we teach them the soft skills too, right? And it's important and it's significant. Uh, it's called the Hidden Genius Project. It, it project is significant because uh, black males are mentoring these inner city, you know, uh, socio, uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged black males teaching them problem solving, math, uh, coding, and, and just sort of how to, how to take a, an idea from the initial conception stage to, um, you know, to actually a, a full-blown product that they develop on their own. So uh, but my, my biggest thing, though, it always has been, and I know uh, Kwame was really big on this, and, and a, a number of others, uh, Enoch, Mike, and, and a number of others in here uh, were really big on mentoring as well, and I think we, we all have to do it. Yeah. 
Um, I just wanted to mention one of my favorite essays from one of our graduates this past year um, who had lost his brother to gun violence. Um, and so he's kind of describing the situation and he comes to a moment in the essay where he has to ask the question, what is a man? I don't know. I don't have any examples of this in my family. I haven't seen what it looks like. Um, and so as I talk more, I work very closely with our students who are males and females. Um, and so a lot of the guys, it's something that they want. Like I need, I need a role model, and like it's so great to know you, but I don't know what this looks like for me as a man. What role am I supposed to be playing in my family? I don't have a father, my mother expects me to do all these man of the house things, I'm 18, I'm trying to go to college. You know, like I need someone to show me how to do it. Um, and so for us, I mean, we don't have kind of a big scale mentoring program or some of the smaller interventions we've seen is being able to get voices from slightly older males who are doing what we would expect our younger males to do those voices into the classrooms or in kind of into their hearing. Um, so one kind of very simple intervention that we've seen in the literature and that we've replicated at our school um, is getting testimony from God. We have one student um, who went on before everyone else. And we know that in terms of college persistence, mindset plays a big part in that. Um, kind of in two ways, one has to do with social belonging. Do I belong here? Are there people like me here? Is this what I should be doing? The other has to do with academics. Like, can I, can I actually handle it? Can I do it the moment I face the challenge? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Um, so we primed this student and asked him, when you didn't feel like you belonged on campus, what did you do to feel like you belong? Those sorts of questions. Um, so we've recorded those from students who look like the students that we have, they know this student, and then we bring those back, show them to the students, and then we do um, kind of further, further um, activities with them to kind of think about what it means and how would you advise someone like you. So being able to have a role model who's doing, who's been where you're trying to go, who you can relate to, um, kind of makes it easier. You need, I mean, it's role modeling, which we all know of, but I'm just hearing it from the mouths of the students is something that's really powerful for them. Yeah, and the one thing, so in walking through Harlem Children's Zone with Kwame uh, a few times, one of the things that's actually really striking is the number of black males that are there teaching classrooms. My schools do not look like that. I want to get them to look like that. So the onus is on the, the me's and the Kwame's of the world to like actually on our human capital shops place a significant emphasis on hiring diverse folks with diverse experiences who look like our kids. And I'm wondering, Pamela, in closing, like, what is the Graduate School of Education doing to churn out more of those folks? We're looking for more people to apply. I think that, I think that part of it, we, we do need black males. Um, down in South Carolina, uh, colleagues of mine have a program called Call Me Mister. And it's about recruiting um, black males um, at Clemson and um, University of South Carolina to go into education. We need to make it an honorable and honored profession. Meaning we don't say I'm just a teacher and we pay people accordingly. Excuse me, Jay-Z had a second grade teacher. <laughs> had a fifth grade teacher. What did he or she make compared to what they're making? Um, I think that we just have to think about our distribution of resources. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank the panelists. Tonight at the gala, go and harass them about any patients.